Good morning. Welcome to the house of the Lord. How is it with your souls? Don't have, we're, we're down quite a few people today, and that may be because we have had uh, a, a handful of people who, who tested positive for COVID over the last week and a half, and we put out something saying, look, if you're, you've been exposed to someone, if you're not feeling good, don't come. Join us on uh, our live stream. And so I'm hoping there's a lot of folks back there joining us from home this morning. Um, folks, we've done a great job for you know two years of dealing with this, but it's still out there. We can't let our guard down. And the numbers are starting to creep up again because we're letting down our guard. So don't let down your guard. Uh, continue to wash your hands. Continue to social distance as, as is appropriate and wear a mask if, if need be. But if you're not feeling good, then, then monitor those symptoms. And if you've been exposed to someone, then stay away for a week until those symptoms go away. Um, this is a reminder this morning that uh, we're preparing for next week, Memorial Day weekend, a presentation to honor our, our men and women in uniform who are no longer with us. And if you have a family member or it's someone from the church, we would like to honor them. And if you could send uh, or turn in a, a photograph, the name, what branch of the military they served in, and the years, if you know that, we would love to honor them in this presentation. Also, on June 5th, on Pentecost, we're going to have one combined service like we did at Easter. We're going to be bringing in the confirmands and new members. And following that, we're going to have a meal down in Celebration Center. And it's free. It doesn't cost you anything. But we do need you to sign up for it out on the connections table so we know how much food to prepare. So that's out there. Um, tomorrow is the deadline for Vacation Bible School. Uh, and it's filling up pretty quickly. And if you would like to send your child to Vacation Bible School, um, please, please do so. Call the church office or see the children's department downstairs. Um, we haven't done one here for uh, quite a few years. And so we're excited about this. And I hope you are as well. The other thing that we've been doing is... Uh, we, we help support Dwell Orphan Care, which is a ministry started by Jennifer Lake, who is the husband of Reverend Matt Lake, who's the pastor at First United Methodist Church in Williamsport. And Jennifer's been here before and done presentations, but we have been collecting this whole month gift cards to help Dwell Orphan Care. And um, to, just to give you an idea of who Dwell is, there's this short video. Hope Chest is Dwell's foster closet. Essentially, it is a space that's full of new and like new clothing that has been donated, um, as well as hygiene items, towels, necessities. And when children enter foster care, it's not uncommon for them to come with very little, if any, clothing at all. So when we learn of a family in the community that has taken placement of a foster child or a sibling group and those children don't have any clothing, um, we're not okay with that. And the community is not okay with that. So we've opened the hope chest and now we can respond to that need and we drop off um, about two weeks worth of clothing to that family for those children. We like to do that within 24 to 48 hours of finding out about that referral. So if you're, you know, still willing, next week you can still bring the stuff in and, and the gift cards and put them out in the, uh, the boxes out here. And um, today is Camp Promotion Sunday. That's why I'm dressed this way, because if I go to camp, this is normally how you will find me dressed at camp. And so I thought, since I'm promoting camp, I will come in my, my, my uniform for camp. So we're going to be learning a lot about camp and singing types of music that we would sing at camp, and I hope you'll enjoy it. So let us begin worship in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.
Friends, Lucy's not feeling well today, and so instead of uh, putting all this on Lila, and we thank Lila for filling in, um, I'm going to be accompanying us on, on most of the music this morning, and that's okay because the guitar is campy, right? It's about being at camp. So would you please stand and join me in our call to worship, Morning Has Broken. has broken like the first morning. Blackbird has spoken like the first bird. Praise for the singing. Praise for the morning. Praise for them springing fresh from Now, if you'll remain standing and join me in our opening, opening song, God of Wonders. Lord of all creation.
Please join me in the prayer for the day. <clears throat> God of the forest, forest. Ocean, ocean, and desert, desert, we praise your holy name. For thousands of years, people have worshipped you in your creation. Help us today within these walls to see beyond the brick and the mortar and to remember the feel of the elements, the smell of the earth, and see the beauty of the outdoors. Help us this morning to rest in you, that we may hear your voice and be at peace. Amen. Please continue your prayers in the silence of your heart. You may be seated. Amen. The words from the scripture say, come near to God, and God will come near to you. Join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We've added a few extra songs in here since it is camp promotion. And this is a song we like to do at camp. Would you join me in singing Awesome God? When he rolls up his sleeves, he ain't just putting on the Ritz. Our God is an awesome God. There is thunder in his footsteps and lightning in his fist. Our God is an awesome God. And the Lord wasn't joking when he kicked them out of Eden. It wasn't for no reason that he shed his blood. His return is very close, and so you'd better be believing that our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. And when the sky was starless in the void of the night, our God is an awesome God. He spoke into the darkness and created the light. Our God is an awesome God. The judgment and wrath he poured out on Sodom, the mercy and grace he gave us at the cross. I hope that we have not too quickly forgotten that our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. And now as we turn our hearts and our thoughts to our offering, and the boxes remain in the back of the church, 
We are blessed to be a blessing, so let us consider how our offerings of tithes and our gifts of service of ourselves may be used to bless others that we come encounter with. join me in the prayer of dedication. Gracious God, I dedicate these gifts to your kingdom work and my life to you as a living sacrifice, bringing all my actions under the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, come and fill your temple. Amen. You may be seated. You know, when we think about camp, you can't help but think of the, the song, Kumbaya. It might be the very first camp song. I don't know, but it, it's one that when we think about camping, uh, we, we go to. And it means, come by here. Come by here, Lord. And so will you join me in our prayer hymn by singing the first verse of Kumbaya twice. Kumbaya, my Lord, Kumbaya. Come by here. Lord, this morning we pray that you would come by Muncie, Pennsylvania, that you would come by our church here at First UMC. Lord, come by and celebrate with us in our victories. Those who have graduated or are going to graduate, those who have 
accomplish things, birthdays, anniversaries, Lord, come by here and celebrate. But Lord, come by here as well and, and hear our, our concerns. Come by here and be with those who grieve. Come by here and strengthen those who are, who are weak and with sickness. Come by here and heal those who need healed. Lord, come by here and, and give faith to those who doubt. Come by here and give strength to those who need to persevere. Lord, come by here and give hope to those who feel like there is no hope. Lord, we pray that you would come by here and, and stop and stay a while with our first responders. Come by here, Lord, and strengthen our doctors and our nurses. Come by here and be with our men and, uni men and women in uniform and keep them safe. Lord, we pray that you would come by here and be with each one of us. Lord, our hearts are full of things we celebrate, things we grieve, things we fear, things we have doubts of. And we wonder, where can we look to? Well, our hope, it comes from the Lord. And so we pray that you would come by here and give us that hope, give us that strength. So, Lord, we take a moment. We just take a moment to open our hearts and give all of our concerns over to you. This morning, I was going to have the choir sing an anthem for us. That was one of our camp songs. Um, but also, there was illness within the choir. So guess what? You're the choir this morning. So will you join me in singing another camp favorite, Shine, Jesus, Shine. i 
darkness. Search me, try me, consume all my darkness. Shine on me. Shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze. Set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow. Flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and So our faces display your likeness, ever changing from glory to glory. Mirrored here, may our lives tell the story. Shine on me, shine on me, shine, Jesus, shine. And now let us pray together the prayer of illumination. Holy Spirit, help us to hear your word as it speaks to us, the pages of scripture and creation. Amen. The scripture today is from Genesis, the six days of creation and the Sabbath. In the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, The earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. God called the dome sky, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with a seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them be be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night, and the stars 
God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind, with which the waters swarm, and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind, and the cattle of every kind, and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus, the heavens and the earth were finished and all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it, God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. On a warm, humid summer evening, 90 teenagers gathered with their camp counselors at the edge of a lake. It was Thursday night of a week of church camp, which meant only one thing. It was commitment night, a night set aside for them to consider giving their hearts to the Lord. And on this particular night, the staff had planned a Galilean service. Now, if you're unfamiliar with a Galilean service, each camper is given sometimes a banana split boat or a aluminum pie pan and a candle and they place the candle on the pie pan and then push it out onto the lake or down a stream so there are hundreds of candles just floating out there in the darkness now on this particular night the staff decided to help stand up the the candle make it stand up they would glue it down with rubber cement However, very soon, this lovely ceremony would be turned into a chaotic mess. A few of the candles fell over, and unbeknownst to the people setting this up, rubber cement is flammable. And so these pie plates just engulfed in flames, and then they tried to put them out by stomping them out, spreading rubber cement everywhere and, and, and some flames. 
Now, luckily, nothing caught on fire. But that night, they learned that rubber cement is flammable. Another year, when I was a counselor, before lights out, we were just all hanging out in the bunks. And as we were talking, this little mouse came in underneath the door of the cabin, went up the post of the bunk, and went right in this kid's bed. Well, of course, he jumped out of there, and then a second and a third mouse came up and got in. So I got a trash can, and I scooted them in, and I took them outside, and I, I let them go out in the woods. Ten minutes later, as we're talking, here come these three little mice back in the door, up the bedpost, and into this kid's bed. So I captured them again. This time I took them to the far side of the lake, and I let them go. And pretty sure they wouldn't be back, I, had, I said, let's move all your stuff to a, a higher and empty bunk. And as I was helping to move his sleeping bag and stuff, I found that he had a stash of candy shoved down along his mattress, which is why the mice were coming in. That night, that camper learned you don't hide food in your bed when you're at camp. Another year, we had a talent show at the end of the week. And one of our newer young campers, a young girl, she was just very socially awkward and had a hard time fitting in, not just at camp, but at school, she told us. And that night, she decided, as her talent, to do dinosaur impressions. And my favorite was the Velociraptor. <laughs> That's what she did. Now, did any of you feel uncomfortable when I just did that? Imagine. I mean, you didn't know whether, whether to laugh or cry. You didn't know if I was serious or whether I was joking around. But imagine being 80 teenagers watching this. But when that girl got done doing all her dinosaur impressions, not one of those teenagers laughed. They stood up. They gave her a standing ovation and hugs. And that night, that girl learned what it meant to be loved and accepted for who she was. As, like I said, today I'm promoting our camping program, our outdoor Christian education program, which occurs in week-long or mini camps during the summer. And we have four camps in the Susquehanna Conference. One is Camp Penn. It's down in Waynesboro, Pennsylvania, near Chambersburg. The other is at Mount Asbury, near Carlisle, Green Hills, near Huntington, and Wesley Forest, which is just on the other side of Mifflinburg in Weikert. And I've been a part of the camping program now for 40 years, 16 as a counselor and 26, or 14 as a counselor and 26 as a dean of a week of camp. I have a music camp that I do for junior and senior high kids, but our camps are for, for many ages, elementary school up to post-grad. And people ask me, why do you do this year after year? Why are you still doing this? And I tell them the same thing every time. Because there is nothing in our church, nothing in our conference, nothing in our denomination that makes more disciples of Jesus Christ than our camping program. More people make a first-time commitment to Christ, a recommitment to Christ, than in anything else we do, hands down. And that's why I continue to be involved in the Outdoor Christian Education Program. Outdoor Christian Education, that implies that we learn things, people learn things. And as I already stated, uh, they learn that rubber cement is flammable. They learn not to shove food in their bed when they're camping. They learn that in, in the body of Christ, with the, in the family of God, you can find love and acceptance. They learn about God and his creation, about caring and ministering for one another. They learn what it means to be able just to be themselves and not have to put on you know, airs about who they, people think they are. They learn about the love and sacrifice of Jesus Christ. They learn that Jesus loves them and forgives their sins and that there is nothing that can separate them from the love of God. Amen? Amen. That's why I continue to do this. But it's also because I love the outdoors. And I love 
teaching people about God in his incredible creation. I love worshiping God in his most beautiful cathedral, the outdoors, and I love singing praises to God with the assistance of the bubbling brook, the wind, the crackling fire, the insects, and the bullfrogs. Now this morning, we're not out by a stream, we're not under a canopy of trees, and we're not sitting around a campfire. However, I would like to do some teaching about God's creation, or at least his creation story in Genesis 1 to chapter 2, 3. I believe that most of you are aware that the Bible is a very unique collection of books. It was written over hundreds of years by at least 40 different authors. It is it's not a novel to necessarily read from beginning to end, although it has a beginning and an end. The events in between aren't necessarily in chronological order. You can read a story in, in Kings and read about it again, the same story in Chronicles, and then hear even more detail when you get into the prophets because it's the same story being told from a different perspective at a different time in history. The Bible is written in different genres of religious texts, prophecy, parables, gospels, epistles. It's, the writers use different literary forms such as prose and poetry, simile, metaphor, hyperbole, idiom, personification. There are the books of law and the historical narratives, the wisdom literature and the apocalyptic literature. And in addition to all these, the authors use different literary structures or patterns linear patterns, symmetrical patterns, parallel patterns, and chiastic patterns. Sometimes using multiple patterns within the same text, which is the case in today's message. When asked, most people will say that the book of Genesis, or at least chapter 1, chapter 1 teaches us about God's creation of the world. In the beginning, there was nothing, and God said, and you fill in the blank, and it was. And that is true. Genesis 1 is about the creation of the world. However, if you're paying attention, you notice that there are certain patterns, there are certain cadences and refrains that stick out, things that are said over and over throughout this text, such as, let there be, it was so, it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning, on the first day, there was evening and morning. On the second day, there was evening and morning, and so on, so on. Now, I do want to say that, you know, I am not this big brain. When I do my research for my sermons, I'm pulling from different people. I'm pulling from things I learned in seminary. I'm learning things that I read. But this morning, I do have to give special credence to uh, Rob Bell and Marty Solomon for some of this. And if, so, and, you know, if you've been really observant, if you're studying this, you'll notice that day one and day four are connected. On day one, God created light, and he separated the light from the darkness. And on day four, God created the sun, the moon, and stars. Day two and day five are connected on day two, God created the water and the sky. And on day five, God created all the creatures in the water and all the birds of the sky. And day three and day six are connected. God created the land and he separated it from the water and he made all the plants appear upon the land. And then on day six, God created the animals to live on the land and to eat the plants. That's a parallel structure. Things are paralleling each other. Now, if you're really studying this and being observant, then you're going to have some problems with this story. <laughs> because, for instance, God created light on the first day. But when did God create the sun that, that produces light? Not until the fourth day. So that's a problem. That's weird. And then God created plants on day three, but plants need sunlight in order to live and grow, but he didn't create that until day four. So that's a problem. That's weird. And although the story tells about God's creation of the world, it's obvious that this isn't a scientific text. This isn't a 
How did God create the world? Friends, this is a very well-crafted poem. The writer is using repetition, pattern, and refrain to poetically tell us that God created the world, but within it, there's even more deeper meanings. Now, there's a lot to this poem, and I'm not going to go into that this morning, but for our purpose this morning, I want to hone in on one thing, and it, it, it's, a, it's an important thing, I think. I said the ancient writers used different writing patterns. I've already shared with you the parallel structure, but another one is a chiastic pattern. Now, I'm not going to bore you with all of how that works, but in a chiasm, there are characteristics that, that point it out. And the biggest one is that at the beginning of the story and at the end of the story, there is something similar, something the same. And then the next pieces line up in the next pieces. But at the beginning and the end of the story, it's like bookends. And we have that in the creation in Genesis 1. And it looks like this. In verse 2 of Genesis 1, Genesis 1 verse 2, we're told that the earth was formless and empty, meaning there was nothing. There was nothing. It was formless. It was empty. Nothing. And at the end of the story, we're told in chapter 2 verse 2, that when God had finished his creation, his work, he rested, meaning he did nothing. So the story begins with nothing and it ends with nothing. The other thing about a chias chiasmic pattern is that the main point that the author is trying to get to you is usually found right dead in the middle of the story. Now, if you take... If you take the original Hebrew language and you count all the words in this story, right smack dab, the middle word is in the middle of the story and it's the word moad. And it translates as seasons. Seasons. Now, in a story about seven days, where would you expect to find the middle of the story? On day four, right? And what did God create on day four? He created the sun, the moon, and the stars. And when they began to revolve around each other and rotate, what did that create? It created hours and days and years and seasons. Seasons. So right in the middle of day four, the middle of creation story, and right in the middle of this whole text is this word moad, which means seasons. It's pretty amazing but it's not a coincidence. Now, the word for seasons, moad, is also one of four words that can be translated as Sabbath. Sabbath, or the idea of Sabbath, of resting, doing something other, which is exactly what God did at the end of the creation story. God rested. He did nothing. He took a Sabbath. So at the beginning, we have nothing. At the end, we have nothing. And right in the middle, we have Sabbath, nothing. And it's what God commands us to do as well. In Exodus 34, 21, God said, Six days you shall labor, but on the seventh you shall rest, and you, it will, you will keep it as a Sabbath. So the big question is, why did God rest? Why did God take a Sabbath? Was God tired? Did God need to sleep? No. We're told God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He, the psalmist says God never slumbers, nor does he sleep. No, God rested. God took a Sabbath because he finished everything he had set out to do. God made everything, and when it was done, he said, it's good. It's very good. Everything was very good. There was nothing God could do to make it any better. If God had done anything more, he would have messed it up. Rabbi um, David Foreman says that it's like a, a sculptor creating a statue. And you take your chisel and your hammer and you chisel away everything on the statue that you want. And it's coming and it's forming and it's, it's becoming this great thing. And you step back and you go, wow, look at that. And you're like, I think it's done. 
And you got to know when it's done because if you take one more whack of the chisel, a nose could fall off, an ear could fall off, a hand could fall off. One more whack of the hammer and it will ruin the masterpiece. God looked at creation, said it was very good. There was nothing more he could do to make it any better. And God said, enough. God stopped. God rested. But it's not as if God did nothing. Sabbath isn't about doing nothing at all. But God took a break from what he had been doing the other six days. He took a break from his work. And what does that mean, to take a break? It means God stopped and he sat back. He didn't just do nothing, but God sat back and he interacted with his creation. God related to his creation. God sat back and enjoyed his creation that he had worked so hard to make. God enjoyed it. And this is what God calls us to. Right from the beginning of the Holy Scriptures, God calls us to Sabbath rest. And what is Sabbath rest? Like I said, it's not just doing nothing. It's not about a list of do's and don'ts like the, the Jewish people had. Well, you can't do this. You can't do that. You can only walk these many steps on this day. You can't lift anything over this amount. That's not what it's about. Sabbath is about doing something other than what we do the other six days of the week. Six days you shall labor, and on the seventh you will rest and enjoy what you've been working so hard to accomplish. The idea of Sabbath is to take a break from the toil and the grind of everyday work and, and efforts to earn. It's about knowing when to say stop, when to say enough. Jesus said in Mark 3, 27, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. God didn't create everything in six days and say, well, now I'm going to create, let there be Sabbath. Well, now I need someone to, to, you know, uphold Sabbath. So now let me create humanity to uphold Sabbath. No, God created us. And he knew we're going to be working. And so therefore, as a gift, he gave us Sabbath. Sabbath, so that we could get together and enjoy our family and friends, that we could go out and enjoy God's creation. A Sabbath so that we could interact with and relate to and enjoy God's presence. So what does this have to do with church camp? It has everything to do with camp. Church camp is a Sabbath week for your children. It's a week away from what they normally do. It's a week away from school, a week away from homework, a week away from jobs, a week away from chores. It's a week away from sports and practicing. It's a week away from TVs, computers, and cell phones. It's a week away from old friends so they have an opportunity to make new friends. God gave us an off button, friends, and we need to learn how to switch it off. For it's in those moments when we turn off that we are often turned on to God. It's in those Sabbath rests when we can sense God, hear God, feel God, and see God all around us. It's in those moments of Sabbath that we are given in to God. We open our heart to God and we accept God. That's the opportunity that camp, this camp Sabbath gives us and why I continue to do it for 40 years, even though I'm not a kid anymore. And even though I go and, and I, I come home completely exhausted, I am somehow spiritually refreshed and ready to go because I was doing something that I do other than what I do the other six days and, of the week and the other days of the year. It's a Sabbath rest in a holy place. That's why I do it, and that's why I encourage you. Take your kids, take your kids, or send them more kids. 
give their lives to Christ at camp or make recommitments to camp. Many people have done that. I encourage you, send your kids or sponsor a kid to go to camp. Now, I'd like, you to sh I'd like to just take a few moments to show you a day in the life of the week that I dean at camp. Um, so first of all, Wesley Forest is nestled in the hills of central Pennsylvania. This is a view from a cabin, one of the cabins we stay in, looking out through the trees upon the lake. And each morning we begin our day with morning devotions, usually in the chapel in the woods. And then we go to breakfast after that. Now, at the chapel in the woods, at morning devotions, you never know who might show up. But we go to breakfast, and after breakfast, uh, our day begins. And there's plenty of hiking opportunities at camp that lead us over the rivers and through the woods. And you can cross the rivers on a monkey bridge, or a swinging bridge, or a cable car bridge in which you put your friends in it and you pull on a rope and go across the, the, the stream. Our hikes take us to places like Fossil Rock down along Penn's Creek, through covered bridges, along picturesque streams, and to scenic overlooks at Chimney Rock. During the day, the campers are encouraged to participate in our challenge course. There's like, I don't know, something like 20 different challenges in there from ropes types things to logs that they got to figure out how to move their team around without falling off of to tire swings and uh, 15 foot walls that they, they work together to get each other over. After lunch, we usually hit the lake for some swimming and boating. Or you can just hang out on the dock and let your feet sit in the cool water and talk. We take the kids on stream strolls and that stream right there is very cold, but they seem to like it. <laughs> some of our meals are held in the dining room. Most of them are in the dining hall. But some are at the outdoor pavilions. There's also a time during the day just to relax, to sit on the porch on the rocking chairs and make new friends and, and talk about the day. And there's a, a portion of the day that's set aside to go to the snack shack. There are also many field games to play. There's nine square in the air. There's human foosball, soccer, frisbee, volleyball. After dinner, we have a variety of evening recreations, mostly created by our counselors. I will usually one night a week take some of the kids who want to go on a Rick's Plants and Ants, and we'll look at edible plants, and I'll give them an opportunity to taste some things, and we look for salamanders and lizards and ants and things like that. We also may do a cardboard boat races, in which we give the kids a pile of cardboard and three rolls of duct tape, and they begin to fashion their boats, their vessels, And then we race them. And some do pretty good. Others, eh, not so well. And others, not at all. We have the champions, and then there is the agony of defeat. We usually make tie-dyed t-shirts every year. And they come out pretty good, pretty colorful. We also play group games in the evening. We use the earth ball, where we can kick it around and throw it around. We do shaving cream wiffle ball, where we fill a wiffle ball full of shaving cream, and when you hit it, it explodes. And then you slide into home base. And at camp, there is a, a toboggan run for the winter time that comes down off the hill. But in the summertime, we turn it into a water slide. 
And one, one of my counselors and I decided to try to use a vinyl mattress, and it worked pretty good. If it rains, we just play indoors. We do minute to win it games and, and just have fun inside. We also have times of singing at camp. Some of the songs, a lot of the songs we just sang earlier today, we do. And the staff likes to create evening night themes, like we'll give everyone big sunglasses. We've also had uh, a luau night. And you never know who's going to show up at a luau either. We have glow nights where the kids get glow-in-the-dark rings and, and you know, uh, the sticks that break. We have glow-in-the-dark paint that they can put on their faces, glow-in-the-dark frisbees, balls, all kinds of things. We just have a blast in the dark with the glow-in-the-dark. And sometimes there's hippie nights. <laughs> we end each day with evening vespers around the campfire, singing praises to God, having skits that have to do with the day's theme. And on Thursday nights, we have commitment nights where the kids are given an opportunity to make that commitment or that recommitment to the Lord. And on Friday nights is Holy Communion. And all of this and a ton more all happen out in God's great creation. Now, friends, whether you're a kid or an adult, you need to learn, we all need to learn, how to say enough, when to stop. God is a God who knows when to stop, and we are being created in God's image, and so we need to learn when to say enough is enough. We need to learn when to hit that off button and just rest in the Sabbath of the Lord You need it, and your kids need it. And camp is a great way to learn how to Sabbath. It's a great way to experience a Sabbath, to experience something other than you're normally used to. And so if you would like to know more about the camping program, I would love to sit down and talk to you. Our church offers scholarships to help pay for that. And if you think camp's only about the children, it's not. If you would like to be a counselor, I've got people who would love to have you come for a week and volunteer your time, and I guarantee you it will be a highlight of your year. So if you'd like to know more about the camping program, please talk to me. Amen and amen. And now I invite you to stand and join us in our closing song. And if Kumbaya was the first song that was ever done, this one might be the next. Um, this is... One of the songs that you just can't help but think of when you think of going to camp, and that is Pass It On. It only takes a spark to get a fire going, and soon Let's go. 
I want to pass it on. I'll shout it from the mountain tops. Praise God. I want my world to know the Lord of love has come to me. I want to pass it on. My friends, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit go with you. Go forth in love and peace and pass it on. Amen and amen. amen.